and welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history in 20-minute episodes. I am your host, Hazel Baker, Qualified London Tour Guide and CEO of London Guided Walks. You can follow us on Twitter at guided underscore walks or find us on Instagram at walk underscore London or indeed we're also on Facebook and we're London Guided Walks. We have lots of lovely guided walks and private tours, treasure hunts and virtual tours for Londoners and visitors alike. You can check all of those out on our website, londonguidedwalks.co.uk. And don't forget, our blog is regularly updated with posts written by our passionate team of qualified tour guides. And there are hundreds to choose from, all absolutely free. So without further ado, let's get on with the show. 2020 and beginning of 2021 haven't been all that fun, but you know what? We have had it worse. Joining me in the studio today is City of London tour guide Ian McDermott, and we are going to be talking the Black Death. Hello. Hi there. Yeah, this should cheer everybody up, shouldn't it? (laughs) The Black Death is the name given to the first wave of the plague that swept across Europe in the 1300s. It was the deadliest pandemic recorded in human history. It resulted in the deaths of up to 75 to 200 million people in Europe, Asia and North Africa, peaking in London from 1348 to 1349. The Black Death was the result of a highly infectious disease spread by fleas that bit their hosts, usually rats and humans, and introduced the bacteria Yersinia pestis that caused the disease into their hosts' bodies. Now, Ian, considering the size of these tiny, tiny fleas, uh, how did they manage to do so much damage? It's a very good question, and it's one that baffled scientists um, at the beginning of the 20th century. If we go to the 1890s, there was an outbreak of plague in China in 1894, and Europe sent its best epidemiologists over to study this outbreak. And these included a Frenchman by the name of Yersin, And he's the one who identified the bacterium responsible and the disease since been known as Yersinia pestis after him. But there remained a big problem and that was how the disease was actually transmitted. The plague, this outbreak in China, moved to India and in India there was something called the India Plague Research Commission and it was their work at the beginning of the 20th century that established it. Initially, they thought, well, it might have been transmitted directly from human to human. Then they thought maybe human fleas did it. And then they began investigating rat fleas. But the problem with fleas is that if they bite a human, a human's very big, first of all. So getting you're you're not going to get very much bacteria out of a flea bite of a human. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the fleas themselves are very, very small. They've got very small stomachs and their noses, where they'll be biting their proboscis, are small as well. So it's a bit of a puzzle how you could get enough disease material in from a flea bite. But they they nailed it down eventually. They nailed it down to uh, rat fleas rather than human fleas as the, the vector for the disease. And one significant thing about the way the disease progresses is that when it infects a flea, and we're talking about the fleas of black rats, ratus ratus, it causes a blockage in their stomachs. And this blockage causes them to regurgitate a lot of the bacteria into the bite wound that they're making. And, and this is how the disease gets going. And it's also very important, this blockage in the stomach, because it means that the disease maintains its virulent character. Why is that? you need a virulent form of the plague to cause this blockage in the flea's uh, tummy. Oh, so we know how it's caused now, but what, in 1349, what did they think? Their main explanation for it was that it was God's punishment for the sins of mankind. And when they knew that the plague was on its way, or when it originally broke out, one of their... One of the principal reactions of it was to have these uh, religious processions um, to uh, show penitence and to try and ward off the disease. Another explanation of it was that it was due to some kind of pestilence in the air, that it was associated with some kind of rottenness in the air, a bit like miasma uh, would, be, uh, would be used to explain the plague later on in the uh, 17th century. And then they could also come up with other explanations, one notable one being astrology. The University of Paris was, after the outbreak, asked to explain what caused this terrible disease. And they went back and looked at their charts and they noted um, conveniently that there was some cataclysmic event in the heavens uh, just before it all happened. So they they had various ways of explaining it. Um, What they didn't know about 
crucially, was fleas. Mm -hmm. I had read that the king had requested that the streets been cleaned, and the response was that um, they couldn't because the street cleaners had already died of the plague. Oh, OK. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> well, one of the things that affects London um, is that there are subsequent outbreaks, and there's one in 1361, and Edward III issues this ordinance, uh, which we talk about in one of our tours, actually, when we go around the Shambles, which was the, the meat market uh, around the Newgate area. He issues an edict saying, you will not slaughter animals uh within the city of London and it was because of all the offal and everything that was created by the, the slaughtering of the animals and this this shows this concern with bad smells bad air mm -hmm. uh, being a possible cause yeah your medieval walks very good one by the way oh thank you yeah I enjoyed doing it so here's a big one how did the black death get its name well it feels as though it ought to be descriptive it feels as though it ought to be describing the symptoms of the people who suffered from the disease and in a way Unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, Philip Ziegler, who wrote a, a very good textbook, still a very good textbook in 1969, he offered an explanation for how this name came around. And he says that it's a, it's a later invention, but contemporaries didn't use it. And he speculates that it's a mistranslation of the Latin artra mors, and artra can mean black, but it can also mean dreadful. So it was probably just a description, dreadful death. I think that sounds even better. The dreadful death, don't you? Yeah, I agree. Uh, we're stuck with black death. And it, like a lot of historical terms, it's one for convenience. Everybody knows it. So we're just going to carry on using it. You kind of hinted about the name being uh, descriptive. And we had these buboes, didn't we? Yes. So the, the, the main symptom of bubonic plague is the development of these boil-like buboes at the uh, end of the lymphatic system. So... The way bubonic plague is an infection of the lymphatic system, typically you'd be bitten on the leg and you'd develop these buboes in the groin or on the thigh. But if you're bitten a bit higher up, you could well develop buboes in other lymphatic nodes, so the, the armpit, on the neck, behind the, the ear. And what would happen is that the disease from the, from the initial bite would take about two to five days to incubate before you started feeling the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And then you, you'd feel unwell and you'd be dead within two to five days. Probably. Now, I know that you disagree with this, but I'm <laughs> going to say stick with my figure of 80% mortality for bubonic plague. Uh, though I can actually speak for you and say that you think that it was much lower, don't you? you yeah, with bubonic, I've read um, 50%, okay. whereas the septicemic and the pneumonic is near to 100%. Okay, well, I'm sticking with my 80%. But anyway, what, what, we, what Hazel's just mentioned is that there are two further varieties of bubonic plague, uh, pneumonic and septicemic. So I've said that bubonic is an infection of the lymphatic system. What could happen is that if the attack was very virulent, the disease could spread out into the the bloodstream and then you've got septicemic plague and or it could spread out into the lungs in which case you've got pneumonic plague and with these you you don't get the buboes unless you've got bubonic plague as well with the septicemic you'd get kind of blotches under the skin and then you'd be dead very quickly pneumonic you would be uh, spitting blood towards the end and you'd have blood coming out of your nose as well so it was quite easy to identify mm -hmm. and when we're talking about the disease sort of spreading out from the lymphatic system we're then talking about secondary pneumonic plague one of the characteristics of pneumonic plague is that we've said that it need the disease needs a flea to transmit it. Pneumonic plague can be transmitted directly from human to human. So if you mm -hmm. breathe in the droplets of somebody coughing and they've got pneumonic plague or you come into contact with their sputum, you, you can contract pneumonic plague. And if you contract it directly from somebody without getting bubonic plague, then it's known as primary pneumonic. Yeah, and I have recently read an article which suggests that London had a combination of bubonic and pneumonic to deal with. Yeah, my understanding is that there, there, there would have been these other varieties, septicemic and pneumonic, but they would have played a, a minor role that the majority of people would be bubonic. But we have to say that there's a huge debate over this. And I mean, it's enormously difficult to use medieval documents. Uh, well, in fact, it's very difficult to use any documents really from before the, the, the development of modern medicine and, and be precise about people's symptoms. So there's a lot of debate about it. And perhaps we should mention if we haven't done already, but there's an awful lot of, lot of debate as to whether it was actually Yersinia pestis. We're running with it as Yersinia pestis, but there's a lot of literature saying that it was actually some other illness that killed everybody off. Yeah, and if you want to read any more um, about it, we're going to include a lot of the links to our reading for your further reading in the show notes. And you can access that by going to londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast and clicking on the Black Death link.
So Ian, what did the authorities try to do to stop the blood death? Well, unfortunately, here we're limited by our sources. It, one of the frustrating things about the Black Death is, as you described it, this is the biggest disaster in a way to affect Western Europe. But the sources in general are fairly patchy. And for London, we don't really have any ordinances uh, saying the, the government is saying to people, the, the government of London is instructing people to do this and do that. We don't have that. What we have got is a lot of information from Italian cities and Italian cities were the government was very well developed. They they had the they were the wealthiest cities in in the world. They had the greatest, the most developed bureaucracies. And we've got a lot of information from them. And in the link, we'll include a book by, uh, edited by Rosemary Horrocks, where she brings a lot of these sources together. And that's one of my favourite books on, on, on this subject. And one of the um, documents that she, she has in that book is a list of ordinances from Pistoia. And in Pistoia, they're, they're doing all the kind of things that you might expect with an outbreak. They're, they're limiting, they're saying you cannot go in out, out of the city, you cannot come into the city you cannot trade in um, uh, second-hand cloth Um, there are instructions about uh, burials and all the rest of it and we don't have this in London but we can infer that the London government was doing something and we can infer that from the uh, emergency cemeteries that created so there were three of them Uh, there was uh, one in West, West Smithfield one in Clerkenwell, associated with St Paul's, and one to the east, which is known as the East Smithfield Cemetery, also the the, the churchyard of Holy Trinity Priory. The fact that they made these emergency cemeteries indicate that obviously they had a big, big problem with a very, very large number of deaths. Some of the archaeologists looking at this have also speculated that there's an increased frequency of the use of wooden coffins. And this is something that they they are big on in in Italy, for example, in Pistoia, they, they say if you're burying the dead you must do in you must do so in a wooden coffin so that means expense but the idea is that if you've got a a container around the body you are in some way trying to contain the disease so so we can look at that and we we can infer that the 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 city authorities were 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 taking action and one of these emergency cemeteries that in East Smithsville they did a big excavation in the 1980s and you know quite a lot about that. So can I ask you about what they what they found when they did the dig there? You might be surprised to learn they found bodies. Oh, good. Yeah. To start. <laughs> um, a total of 636 individuals. And they were in two areas of this emergency cemetery. And they found them in both in mass graves and then also individual burials as well, which I was surprised to learn. Because I would have thought they would have just been placing them in as quickly as they possibly could because we we hear accounts of you know 20 40 60 bodies being buried any one day and that's a lot of bodies to to bury isn't it it is and i guess that when they've buried them individually they've got time to do it and when they're doing a sort of mass burial it's obviously the cartloads are coming into the cemetery however i'm right on time saying that even when they're doing them in the mass graves they're just not sort of they're not Tipping them in by a wheelbarrow, they're, they're taking no. care over arranging them, aren't they? Yeah, and, that, and that's the imagery that you get from, you know, TV and even some books that I've read. But no, they're actually properly placed and given respect and they they even have shrouds. Yeah, so they're, they're facing the right way. So on the Day of Judgment, when they rise up, they're facing the right way. That's right. They don't have to turn around. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, so this this um, cemetery, so this was purely uh, an emergency one for the Black Death. It covered an approximate area of two hectares. They're still estimating that 40 to 50% of the cemetery is still in situ. They mm. haven't looked at that yet. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So there's plenty for uh, for future archaeologists to get stuck into. Yes, and the uh, Charterhouse Square excavation, which I was mentioning earlier on, where they just basically done a tiny sample through the cross for, cross rail work. Uh, the estimates are that there are between two and twenty thousand people buried there. So very wide range of estimates, but obviously a very very large cemetery. Yeah. Well, what they found with the demographic profiling of this uh, emergency cemetery, they found that 27.8% of the burials were juveniles. Mm -hmm. And most of those are over five years of age. So that leaves the 72.2% being adults. However, the majority of adults there had died before they had reached the age of 35. So this tentatively shows that the way the, the disease kills people who are, you would assume, being relatively good health yes it's a, it's a cross-section of the the population it's not the rich or the poor or good diet or bad diet even though i have read articles saying that diet did help keep people healthy but
but no matter the, your age, you if you were going to get it, you you were going to get it. Now, Ian, you mentioned about not having very much information for London specifically, but what sources do we have? Yeah, well, the sources that we have are obviously very helpful. Uh, so the things that we've got are a lot of information about wills. So in London, there was the Court of Husting, which is the equivalent to the county court. And the wealthy would draw up their wills in this court and they would then subsequently have them enrolled. Uh, so after they died, that's the kind of official registration of the of the will. And there are problems with this information. Sometimes the court wasn't sitting. But nevertheless, the volume of wills being drawn up, people tended to draw their wills up just before popping their clogs. And you obviously, if you had the plague, you, you, you'd know you're about to go. And this, the you can see that from the volume of wills being drawn up and wills being enrolled, you can roughly trace the progress of the disease. England as a whole that's excluding London, is very good for sources, relatively very good for sources. And most of the studies of the Black Death in a European context rely heavily on this English material. And the quality of the evidence in England as a whole comes from institutions, which we don't have for London. Institutions are when people are appointed to religious offices. So if they've died, there'll be an increase in these institutions. The other big source for England as a whole is manorial court roles, very good source of information when a tenant dies it's recorded in the court roll so again you can monitor the progress of the disease now because we're saying we don't have these institutions for the manorial court rolls we got the problem that people in london weren't living in manors however there were some manors in the immediate vicinity of london and mm-hmm. in particular there was a very large one at stepney which belonged to the bishop of london and then again you can use the evidence from that to sort of roughly track the progress of the plague so i think as we were saying earlier again there's debate about all of these things but it probably gets going september october 1348 goes through the winter big debate whether it slows down in the winter or, or, or gradually builds up and then it reaches a climax in march time march april before dying out in the summer of 1349 so the most of the damage was done by summer 1349 but what were the consequences of this for london and londoners Well, the effect can be broken down into uh, a lot of people dying and London becoming a lot emptier, I I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of population, we've got a quite a good handle by medieval standards on what the population was in the late 14th century. Poll tax records from 1377 indicate population around 40,000. And the middle area of guesses for before the plague are about 80,000. So... Mm pretty dramatic collapse in the population and then we must say that that's actually more dramatic in london isn't it where 50 percent of the population go compared to a third england wide yes 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 indeed there are various other consequences that fall from this this huge human tragedy one is that presumably the city is a lot emptier now we don't have a lot of direct Uh, evidence for this but in 1357 the londoners petitioned the king edward iii saying that their tax burden should be lightened and they mention in this petition that the city is one third of the buildings are empty now special pleading yes but on the other hand it seems quite plausible and also they're not that far away from Westminster so they can't really dress it up too much they can't diverge from reality too much the other one of the immediate effects is that with this collapse in the population you've got a shortage of labourers it's very difficult to find people to do the work for you and they they Mm -hmm. demand more money and one of the first things that uh, Edward does during the plague itself is to issue the ordinance of labourers in which he says labourers cannot work for more than they did before the plague and then this becomes the statute of labourers a bit later on now people are prosecuted under this so action is taken but the fact that they they repeat it or the ordinance becomes a statute and then i think it becomes reissued indicates that it wasn't really very effective and the price of labour went up and we can also see the price of a lot of commodities going up as well basically with fewer people around labourers earning more money the common sort of people are are wealthier they've got more money to spend and things like salt go up in price we can see the price of salt doubling in in london even after 671 years the black death has left its mark on london reminding us of the devastation that disease can inflict on communities If you've visited Westminster Abbey, you may have noticed a large slab in the southern cloister. This is believed to cover the remains of the Abbot of Westminster and 27 of his monks who were taken by the Black Death. 
And I've got some news as well, Ian, oh, about yeah. consequences of all of our hard work for this uh, lockdown podcast. Uh, we have now reached 20,000 downloads. Oh, very good. Yeah. So uh, uh, th- thank you very much for your contributions. Oh, my God. Uh, and thank you very much for everybody listening. And don't forget, this is absolutely free. So share the love of London and our London History Podcast with your friends and family. We'll see you next week for something a lot more fun. Mm-hmm.